And good afternoon, everybody. It is the ASPCA Friendly Dog Day on the Legacy Leadership Radio Show. Oh my gosh, that's the most beautiful dog. And I know that backyard, I know that dog, I know that man, and I know the little boy on the left. Hello, Adrian Chenault. How are you, buddy? <laughs> I am good. That is a seriously cute dog. It's good that we finally got... How's that for cutting it close? <laughs> <laughs> wow, still got your golf glove on. <laughs> Tough, tough. It's hard to be Richard Bushbrook. You know what I mean? There's not a lot of people that can do it. That's that's true. That yep. is true. Oh, well, yeah. we are super excited to have you in the house. The father I never... Oh, wait. Hello, father. And we are going to have an amazing, amazing the conversation dad. today. There you go. He'd take me golfing. So well, think about we, it this way, Adrian. If you were my son, this is where you and your family would be... Kate vacationing right now for the holidays right there you go but instead what is it like 20 below where you are <laughs> you know i uh it is it's a frozen look at, that ice, out there. look at that despicable ice weather out there on that lake it's horrible but he said i'm in san antonio it's 76 and sunny baby so life is good i'm all right ah okay I got <laughs> i'm the only one with issues so really good to have you aboard richard we, uh, we love you, and it is really an honor, and I just want to say that because I was talking to you yesterday, and I didn't ask you to be on the show until the last minute, and you thought because everybody else told me no, and you need to know that you are the most important guy in the world, and you were my first round draft choice, and you did it, and I can't thank you enough, so just... Take that one to the bank. And At 6 a.m. this morning. Yeah. <laughs> the first round draft pick at 6 a.m. Hey, Adrian, who do we have on this week? Well, I haven't got anybody. To... Who do you have, Dad? Who do you... Hey, Denise, who do you think you are? Who can we call? <laughs> yeah. We, you know, we just, we, we only asked like low double digits number of people to be on the show before you, Richard. So you should, you know, that's not bad. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, hey, you know, I'm just the standby guy. You know, if you need somebody, I'm here. Well, we, so let's, we talk about, you. let's talk about Nathan Ricks for just half a second, because that's one of the most tragic stories. Uh, Richard's an aviation guy. I'm an aviation guy. Jordan Adler obviously lived through that horrible uh, helicopter crash. It's our worst nightmare because things go wrong in airplanes, usually pilot error, and you usually don't live through it. And that's just a tough, tough deal, right, Richard? Yeah, and you know, Nathan, uh, Nathan's an, you know, he's an unknown hundred million dollar. He's a hundred million dollar earner. He was at fifty million, like I don't know, maybe ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Um, half a million people in 43 countries. And, you know, his trademark was he provided all the training, all the personal development, all the incentive trips, all the retreats, everything anybody on his team would ever need. They didn't have to get it from New Skin. All they needed from New Skin was products and a commission check. Nathan was... You know, a rare breed. There's not very many people that really earned their seven or eight figures a year. And and he did. And he lived life full out. And I'm sure if if he could share with us, he would say, you know what? I cheated life. I lived more in whatever he was, 58 years old or something, 60 years old, than most people do in 600. And... Yeah. Sad, tragic, um, but hey, it happens, you know. Airplanes and helicopters are not very forgiving. Good friend of the show, good friend of yours, Dan McCormick, good friend of his. I know, I mean, like that was his mentor and his best friend, and just, I know he's heartbroken. So let's just, I mean, everybody, just say a little silent prayer for him today at some point. And his wife lived through the crash. She was in the airplane couple other people in the airplane but it just killed poor that's sad 
So let's just move forward and talk about you a little bit, Mr. Brook. You are traveling the world. You've been out in the, obviously the ranch. And uh, I was talking, I sent you a Christmas present and I was deathly afraid it was going to be a lousy Christmas present, but it was so perfect for your life that I bought one for Denise too. And she has been living that Christmas present and loving it so much that I'm very excited that you're getting back to your ranch so you can get it. So you have something to look forward to that cost me like five bucks. So that's pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you. I'll look forward to it. So Adrian, what's up? That's want to talk awesome. about the substance, Adrian. It's the, we're, now, we're now ready to move to the substance portion of today's broadcast brought to you by Adrian. Um, I, man, that's, that's a tragedy, uh, about the, that crash. And so, uh, I'm glad that we, that we took a moment to, to honor that. And yeah, you know, I, I think one other thing I want to say about Nathan's leadership that is of substance is Nathan did a Saturday, I think it was a Saturday training for his team every Saturday since 1995. You're kidding that's almost 30 years every Saturday without fail since 1995. And he was, my, he was my idol, man. I'm telling you, I was in New Skin. I was something called a diamond qualify, which was kind of a muckety muck. It was right above Ruby. And they told me that I was going to be making $12,000 a month for the rest of my life. And I was all pumped up. But he was the guy that I loved. I don't know why my camera's doing that. But yeah, I got too close. With these lights, Brooke bought me. Brooke bought me yeah. these lights for a gift. Thank goodness I bought him something for Christmas. So yeah. anyway, that's why I'm so washed out right now. It's his fault. But all of you. every time I was with Dan McCormick, and I'm with Dan at least once a year, or talk to him three or four times a year. And Dan is a legacy seven-figure earner with New Skin and one of the brilliant personal development gurus and and leaders in our profession every time i'm with dan he teaches me something that he learned from nathan ricks yeah and you know that's that's the beauty and the gift of leadership and mentorship is when you can pass on lessons you learn from other people second generation Fact. that is a huge anyway, thing and I'm sure i, you I have, mean a specific agenda, Adrian. What are we going to talk about to launch 2023? You know, I, so we often hear these sort of hypotheticals, right? Of like, what would you want people to say about you if you suddenly died in a plane crash or if something happened to you or when you're gone? And we're, you know, uh, the unthinkable that we're living, you know, we're having, we're living the moment that, fa you know, his family is living that moment right now. And yet what an, you know, I would imagine you know, the things that you guys are saying about Nathan right now are pretty high on the list of the things that I would want somebody to say about me if that ever happened to me, or, you know, I think that's, that's really what it's about. And so, you know, let's dive into that a little bit. Let's, let's unpack that a little about what are some of the, the touchstones of, of the things that make for a life that people are going to talk about when you're gone and that you had an impact on them that extends beyond the life that you live, you know, whether, whether you want to tap into it in terms of what you know of Nathan or, or just what you've seen in your own life, Richard, you know, what are the things that stand out to you from that perspective? Because I think that if you want to talk about how to live any year, that's how to live it. Yeah, well, I was um, contemplating on something last week that um, I was talking to with someone or I overheard a conversation. I can't remember really the context of it. But, um, you know, the subject was people in leadership, whether it's Dan McCormick, Tom Chenault, um, Nathan Ricks, and a thousand more. You know, one of the things, especially in network marketing or real estate or um, you know, mortgages, if you're in leadership, if you have a big team, uh, you know, you may only get to meet some people one time. And so what we were talking about was how challenging it is for leaders 
to be present a hundred percent of the time for a hundred percent of the people. So whether you're on a zoom or you're in an event, um, or you're just meeting people at a coffee shop, being present for that person is a challenge for a leader because if you look at a leader's schedule in a leader's life, well, they're just nonstop, you know, person after person. If they're in a in an event, it's like, you know, crowd after crowd, nonstop, and and everybody, you know, wants a picture and everybody wants to get a hug and everybody wants to shake a hand and um, and I think one of the great trademarks of world-class leaders are those individuals that have the motivation and the skills, but primarily the motivation, the gift of being present for everybody. And somebody said, might actually have been Tom telling me this, I can't remember, that, you know, for some of us, you know, we might press the flesh for a thousand people throughout the year or 10,000 people. But for that person, this might be their only time, their only moment, the only time they get to connect, the only time they get to say, I was in that leader's presence. I got a picture. I got a hug. I got a handshake. And they may never get another opportunity. And so if you if you understand that as a leader, it can help bolster your motivation and your focus and your intention to be present 100 percent of the time for 100 percent of the people. It's a huge I think thing. that's critically and, important and it's unbelievably difficult. And I see Eric Worre on here and, you know, there's a guy that people get pictures with him. And it's like a life-defining moment with them. It is, right? <laughs> and the same thing with you, Richard. And oh, yeah. I can't tell you how upset I get when I'm traveling around and people go, can I take a picture? And I go, yeah, we take a picture. And I've given them my best look. And I walk away and they say, thank you, Richard. And I just want to punch them but I'm because they think I was you because they have terrible eyesight. But at the end of the day, uh, yeah, and all of you need to take that really, really seriously because it's something that's going to happen to you and treat everybody like that, like that's that important because it is right, Richard. It is. And, you know, hold I'm, on, hold, you are the world's worst radio host. If I'm not oh, going to no, you in the leg, we are dead. We got to take a quick break and Richard will answer that what? open-ended question on the other side. You're listening to Legacy Leadership with Adrian Chenault, Tom Chenault and Richard Brooke. I'm intimidated. The guy's such a big time guest. I'm intimidated. And there's oh. Eric, Eric Worries commenting through the whole deal. I'm try I've got one eye, as you can tell, and I'm trying to focus in on all this jazz. It's a train wreck of epic proportion. It's all your fault because you're out, out of town in San Antonio. And your we're handler is gone. This is bad news. <laughs> why do you have me? Why do you have me as a guest and Eric Worry commenting? Oh, you all right, hold on. Call. And we're back. It's Legacy Leadership with Adrian Chanel, Tom Chanel, and our guest, Richard Brooke. It's early and we're already going off the rails, which usually means that you're in for a fun show. <laughs> so this is good. And we are having a blast already. Um, just before the break, we were talking about this idea of presence as a leader, whether you're Richard Brooke, whether you're Tom Chanel, whether you're Eric Warre, and just how powerful that is. And I think you know, I want to underscore something about that because I think it is such a, it, it's a leverage point as a leader that is, it, it's costly, I'm sure, to you guys in having the amount of attention that is oftentimes required to put that out into the world like that. But it is so powerful for the reason that you were talking about before the break, that it might be that one defining moment for that person that happened to be the one who had been waiting to meet you that day or whatever. And, you know, I, I remember early in my career, I had, uh, I had just moved to England for the first time. And the guy who was the managing director, who was kind of the, the dude in charge of all of international was based there. His name was Taylor Rose. He actually went on to become the CEO of the company. And, you know, I had no idea if he had any clue who I was. 
And I walked up and I, I was just getting my stuff. I walked into the office and he sort of happened by our sort of desk area. And he goes, Adrian, hey, welcome. I, I heard about you. It's so cool that you're moving your family over here. And he, he threw in something really specific that he obviously asked my boss to tell him something about me. And it, I, I mean, I was like, I worshiped that guy from that moment forward because he had taken that time to know something about me. And yeah. he, you know, he probably didn't feel like it was that big of a deal. And yet it meant everything to me. And he probably didn't necessarily even feel like he was that big of a deal per se. And yet he had that impact on people. And so whether you're, you know, really top tier in your own mind or whether you're not that big of a deal, you have, there are people for whom you get to have that kind of an impact if you'll step up to that. And it makes a big difference in people's lives, doesn't it? It makes everything. And, you know, the, the challenge today is in terms of nurturing our networks and nurturing our relationships and touching people is physical events or, you know, it's certainly our organizations now, whether they're, you know, our actual networks or they're just our, our businesses, they span the whole globe, right? So if you go back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, our network was really people that we saw and met with and worked with. And, you know, it was almost all events, physical events uh, related but now our networks are all over the world and the way we touch them, which may not be a photo and it may not be a hug and it may not be a handshake. It may be a personal message. It may be an outreach. It may be, Hey, Adrian, you were just on my mind this morning and I'm reaching out to wish you an awesome 2023. And you know, how's the, how's the dog? And, you know, whatever you can name the dog, you can name the kids, you can name the spouse. Uh, all of these things are beautifully embedded in shameless plug, but it's for real contact mapping. I mean, contact mapping is the way we can change people's lives forever just by a simple outreach. Whether you do two a day, five a day, or 10 a day, just that simple message hey, I'm thinking about you. How you doing? Tell me a story from 2022. Boom. You made that person's day. And that person may not have been, you know, walking around thinking, gee, I sure wish Tom Chenault would reach out to me. Probably not, right? It's different than at an event, but it has the same impact that we think about people. And the app is the magic of reminding. The app is the magical coach for serving us up. Hey, here's four people. Just click here and change a life. Click here and change a life. That's leadership. And I think in today's network environment where people are virtual and they're all over the planet and they're in every time zone, you know, we can't rely on the hug, the photo or the handshake. We got to rely on the, hey, I'm thinking about you. Tell me a story. Boom. Really helps if you unmute. My dog, my dog decided to jump in there with your dog. So uh, I, I completely agree. And I think that I, I really believe that fewer higher leverage touches where you say something that actually means something to the recipient versus putting the blast, you know, using the blowtorch of the ability that we all have to send a million messages to people because that's just the way that these the, you know the tools allow us to do those things is something super powerful and uh, we actually ran a little bit of an experiment about that which we'll talk about a little bit more on the other side of the break that fits into some of the things that I've learned from you Richard so we got to take another break here in a second this is the short segment you're listening to the Legacy Leadership Radio Show with Adrian Chenault Tommy Tom Tom Chenault and Richard Bliss Brook. We are on the Genesis Communication Network, which we absolutely love. So stick around. We'll be right back. Thanks. What happened? <laughs> oh, you, I was just trying. I wanted to be able to comment. So I tried to sign on and I kicked myself off. That was my fault. But I'm so <laughs> just in awe of Brooke. And one thing that he always says on the shows when we're interviewing other people is, Shut up, Tom, and let Adrian ask 
smart questions. So his prayers are answered, and that's pretty doggone cool. We are coming back right, right now. Bring us back. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Legacy Leadership Radio Show. We've got the most unbelievable guest. Richard Bliss Brook is a guy that is a mentor to me. And since I'm a mentor kind of to Adrian, he's, an, he's a bigger mentor to Adrian. And what's really cool is Adrian looks to him for advice that I can't give. They circumvent me. And I love that the guy is committed to us at a level you wouldn't believe. The messages I get from him about holding myself to a level of integrity that is unbelievable. You just wouldn't believe. So Stacey Clark, I'm never coming to your diner down there in San Antonio or Dallas again. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Bagel nosh or whatever it's called. Take it away. <laughs> Oh, that is so funny. The market, Stacey Con the number one kosher restaurant in Dallas. You <laughs> there you go. <laughs> she said, I you. love the concept of <laughs> shut up, Tom. So there we go. I love it. So we were talking before the break about the, you know, the power of saying something that really means something to somebody. And we we played a little game uh, with this or over the holidays that was really fun. It was called 10 Days of, of Holiday Cheer with Contact Mapping. And we developed a set of messages to kind of the hall, the hallmark card, so to speak, of giving you, hey, here's here's who the kind of person that you ought to reach out to today. Here's some language that you might use to share with them. And then you need to customize it with their name and with whatever you need to do to make it sound authentic to who you are, how you talk and what your relationship is with that person. And we had the most beautiful stories of things that happened where people were reaching out authentically to people that, that, that they cared about and expressing things that a lot of times we just don't take the time to do, or we don't have the courage to do, or we assume that they wouldn't, they wouldn't care or whatever it is, whatever story we tell ourselves. And it was so cool, both for me doing it myself as, as we went along doing this, but also for the people that were part of that program to just see that if you'll just take that little bit of time to reach out in a meaningful way, that incredible things happen. And so much of that is, is predicated on stuff that I, you have been teaching for a long time, Richard, and that really is a big part of this momentum formula that is a, a huge part of how you coach and, uh, and enable people to be effective in building their network marketing business. And so talk about how you see uh, the importance of that consistency of sharing your message in an authentic way with people as really the, the secret key that's hiding in plain sight to create momentum in your business. Yeah, well, I think the key, well, there's several keys, I guess, but I mean, an overlooked key is authenticity. And you know, if I had time to demonstrate it, but, you know, in our coaching classes, when we demonstrate it, the audience is really just gobsmacked at the difference between somebody telling their story. So if I ask you, you know, hey, tell me your story about your product or your income option, almost everybody drops into what I call presentation mode, their state of being, their energy when they're talking to somebody is presentation mode. And that's all like, you know, facts and, you know, features and benefits and hype and you should do this. And it's all sort of very formal. And so then the, the hack that I use to get people to drop into the state of being of authenticity is I ask them, hey, tell me your story, but I want you to imagine that I'm your best friend. And I asked you to tell me your story, your product story, your income option story. Now, remember, I'm your best friend. So I ask him, who's your best friend? Oh, you know, Sally. Okay, I'm Sally. And I'm asking you, Adrian, I know you've been using this product for a year or two. I know you're involved in this income option, but I don't know the whole story. Tell me your story. And as long as you can keep people grounded in and ask a context like that, People will tell their story in such a beautiful, real, honest, transparent, raw, 
way that the listener, this is the person that is, let's say, being prospected or connected with or shared with, they hear the story in a whole different way. They don't hear it like they're a target. They hear it just like a story, just like a pure story. And then, of course, if you teach people to, you know, allow people to, the, you know, the Japanese version, you know, in management, the brilliant Japanese management version is allow people to save face. Allow people to look good in the conversation. And one of the ways you can do that is give people an out, give them an exit by, by telling them up front, hey, it's not for everybody. It's not for most people. It's probably not for you. No is a perfectly acceptable answer, and you're not going to get an argument from me. That allows people to be with you. But when we're in presentation mode and we're telling people what they should use for a product or what they should do with their finances, what they should do with their time, and how they should live their life, and it's all like, you know, fact, feature, benefit, hype. We drive people away. And one of the things that Tom and I have learned by doing this for decades and decades and decades is you're going to meet thousands of people in your life, tens of thousands of people. And hardly any of them are going to be in your network. Hardly any of them are going to join. So the richness of contact mapping, of networking, of connecting and being with people in a way that they can safely be with you is to treat them like a lifetime relationship, not like a prospect, not like a target. And, and not, it's not just a strategy. It's knowing that, my gosh, the value of this person in my life goes way beyond them being a distributor. You know, even if they buy your product or join your team, they're probably going to quit, right? So, so the odds of somebody benefiting you in business are slim to none. But the odds of them benefiting you as a relationship in your life are really all up to you. Because if you're present to them, if you stay connected to them, if you reach out to them two, three, four times a year, or even once a year, and just say, hey, tell me a story. I mean, gold rains down on you throughout your life. I've told Tom, if I would have contact mapped everybody I've met in the last 50 years, the only way I know how to quantify it is in money, but I can quantify it a lot of different ways. I'd be a multi-billionaire. I don't know how, but I know I would be because I've left 99% of the gold in relationships I've left it on the table. I don't remember who they are. I don't remember how I met them. I don't remember their spouse's name. I don't remember what they do for a living. I don't have their cell phone number. <laughs> Nobody's serving up to me. Hey, hey, you might want to reach out to these four people because it's been six months. Just send them a, takes five seconds, send them, send them a text. Nobody's serving that up to me. I leave it all on the table. And as a result, virtually homeless and <laughs> and squalor <laughs> squalor it, <laughs> oh my goodness it, there's there's a lot to unpack there i i think there's a, the the biggest thing is this is none of this is a game we're talking about human beings we're talking about real relationships and real people who have their own set of dreams, their own agendas, their own pressures, their own, all of those things. And if you can move into a space as you have, and as you teach others to do, to meet them there and to show up with your true self there and allow like, lay it out there on, on the table in a way that isn't so promotional people respond differently i don't know have you ever seen richard the there's a, a psycho there, like a, a psychological study that they did about the copy printer and giving people an out have you ever seen this before i think i have yeah so yeah, the the, the basic me. premise is 
that literally, if you, they, they had these people, a big long line at the office, somebody needs to make a copy and somebody walks up to the front of the line and says, Hey, may I cut to the front of the line? And yeah. they go get lost a hole, like right. 95% of the time. But if you walk up and you say, Hey, can I please make a copy? And here's why. Yeah, it's like seventy percent, and, and here, sorry, and here's why being the most ridiculous excuse possible. So, here's why is uh, that I hey, can I please make a copy because I need to make a copy? They're like, or can I go to the front of the line because I need to make a copy? Obviously, you need to make a copy. That's why you want to get to the front of the line. Suddenly, people go through the roof on the. It's like a drastic increase in their willingness to say yes because you shared something about who you are. It's the most ridiculous thing. And so yeah, there's this power. What focused on is by telling somebody why, like why it's important yeah. to you, what your agenda is. It changed the entire game. People could cut in line all day long and everybody was just fine with it. And the applications for that in our people business is, you know, for example, if you're asking somebody to look at your product or look at your income option or watch your video, if you just add, and here's why I want you to look at it, which, you know, it's not, it, it could, you could add, I want you to look at it because I'm trying to make a living doing this. <laughs> and I only get one out of a hundred people to say yes. And uh, that's why, or it could be because every once in a while, somebody tries the product and it changes their life. Or it could be because every once in a while, somebody sees an opportunity for themselves and they start making money and that changes their life. If you add that, why I want to intrude on your life, the gates open. If you just wow. said, hey, hey, watch this video. Hey, try my product. Hey, look at this link. You get slapped around because you're intruding without offering people a piece of your world as to why it's important that you're intruding on them. And we are intruding on everybody, right? There isn't any prospect on any list that's sitting around looking at their phone going, I wish a network marketer would reach out to me or a realtor would reach out to me or a mortgage broker would reach out to me today and tell me what they got to offer. Nobody's waiting for us. Nobody's looking for us. We're in the, if you're a network marketer, you chose the only profession that every prospect has already decided they don't ever want to buy. That's right. That's what we've chosen we to break sell. though. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> We're, I feel a roll coming. We got to take a break. We'll be back right after this. You know, you guys are like driving a car that has a gallon of gas in it. And every Welcome. 10 minutes, you got to stop and put another gallon of gas in it. What? Welcome what is to the Legacy Leadership Monologue Show by Richard Brooke. This is a talk show. That means interact. This guy is so used to doing webinars that he has no concept of you, Adrian. Because he Adrian, said, what time are you? All right, hold on. We're coming back. We're coming back. Stop fighting. Out. And we're back. It's Tom Chanel. That's Richard Brooke. It's Adrian Chanel. It's the Legacy Leadership Show. And what a show we've had. This guy is so deep. And I don't know who, I, I didn't even know you had a daughter named Dag Tagger, but whatever the story is with that person is unbelievable because she actually thinks that Richard looks more fit than me and younger, which is preposterous. But at the end of the day, it must be the lighting. That is not a screensaver behind him, by the way. That is his life in Hawaii. I've been there. How about that? Did you just see what happened in my background when I moved my hands? That was kind of cool. I'm like it's infatuated with those lights, aren't you? Crazy. All right, Adrian, back to you. Let's finish this show up. <laughs> I'll shut up. Oh my goodness. No, no, all right, I'm so... something. What the hell's right. going on with network marketing these days? Are they all gonna go kick the distributors, the actual distributors out, and all the companies gonna go direct sales, uh, Richard? Or is it are we gonna save this profession? with some real network marketing. I'll tell you what's wrong with network marketing today is most of the people running companies, ownership and management are not network marketers. Yeah. 
they've never recruited anybody. They've never acquired a customer. They've never nurtured a customer. They've never had, they never spent a year or two years romancing their best friend or a family member who finally joins, you know, after, you know, like this song and dance for two years, they finally join and, you know, the company screws up their shipment or their check or their enrollment for something, right? They don't get it. To them, network marketing is just a transaction. It's just revenue. It's just a business. And they're asking themselves, what's the most efficient way to use our 40 or 50% that we're spending on commissions? What if we spent that 40 or 50%, which you're talking about tens, hundreds, billions of dollars for some companies. What if we spent that on digital or social media or automation or influences or bots or we got to get with it, right? We got to get on TikTok. Everybody's on TikTok. We're not on TikTok. We're a loser. And so they're, they have a very short term, you know, they're reacting to the Federal Trade Commission instead of all network marketing companies banding together, throwing a million dollars in a kitty. So we got a 50 or $100 million war chest and sue the Federal Trade Commission to establish fair ground rules instead of intimidating every network marketing company thinking you're going to put them out of business. 90% of what comes out of the Federal Trade Commission as illegal is not illegal. It's just their opinion. And they're, they've intimidated every company. Why? Because the people running the companies are not business people. They're not founders. You know, they're not the Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel and the the Mark Hughes and the Larry Thompsons and, you know, the Mary Kays, you know, the people, even Mary Kay with like courage, if you know what I'm talking about, to build something. And so everybody's thinking short term, they're thinking re revenue, they're thinking the stock price of the stock, they're thinking trends, but we don't want to be network marketing. We got to stay away from the Federal Trade Commission. We can't talk about an income option. And let's, uh, let's, Let's do this whole social media bot whatever thing because that's what everybody's doing. Not very many people, maybe if Larry Thompson's on here, have been doing this for as long as I've been doing it. 46 years full time, 51 years total. And here's what I can tell you about network marketing. Social media is a cycle. It's a fad. It's coming and going. It's reinventing all the time. I mean, you tell me when to shut up because I have a lot to say about this. Keep going. Uh, so here's an example. A couple of years ago, my cousin got vaccinated at the same time I did. And he took a picture of me and he put I put it on Facebook, I guess. And I lost about $100,000 worth of revenue on, an, on a program that I was launching because a huge contingency of anti-vaxxers, which were my customers thought I was like insane for getting vaccinated. I don't think they're insane for not getting vaccinated, but they thought I was insane for getting vaccinated. And what that plays to is just because Facebook censored Donald Trump or censored conservative messages, ultra conservative messages, probably 20 or 30% of our clients, conservative network marketers, Boom, they got off Facebook like that, right? They just canceled Facebook, done with it. And now everybody's on Instagram and TikTok. But if we think the future of network marketing is on TikTok, we're insane. TikTok is owned by China. Any company that's based in China owned by the Chinese citizens, by law, the Chinese government has access to all their data. They have access to everything. And if we don't think the Chinese government is going to use TikTok and its influence to influence Americans, we're crazy. TikTok is temporary. It's going to blow up or blow out or get outlawed or something. And social media is just a cycle. It's not any different than 20 years ago when we're all buying 10, 20, 30,000 cassette tapes with our message on it and handing them out and mailing them out to millions of people. Network right. marketing is a legacy opportunity. It's an opportunity for people to build an income 
that is passed down from generation to generation to generation. Some of my clients right now are third generation. Their grandparents built the income and the grandkids are enjoying the income and the products, same product, same company, three generations. The person that's what legacy, that's what legacy is all about. And, and that this is such an important topic and there's got to be that leadership. So Richard Brooke, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been an awesome show. Just you have listened to the, the legacy <laughs> leadership show on Genesis communication. We'll see you next week. Tom Chenault, you are the world's worst radio host. I have messaged you on everything but a smoke signal asking you to help poor Richard to promote the thing that we wanted to help him promote to get any words in edgewise or anything uh, else. Not, and I, so yeah. you are out of the will. <laughs> I was I, 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 he, he brought up TikTok. I was on TikTok, man. I just ran into a swimsuit model and I could I, not stop. I thought watching. I saw him doing a little jiggle. I couldn't figure yeah. out what that was. So we're still on, everybody. Network Marketing Institute, good to see you. Tom Challen, Don hey, Tom Hobbs, Challen. unbelievable. Jordan Kemper. We need all you guys on this show. I was so desperate for a guest, I brought Brooke, but please contact me because I need quality need, guests. But Richard- You need somebody that won't talk the, during the entire show. No, you did a great job. But here's what I, I want you to keep going on that because I'm telling you, I'm scared that those, you know, I was talking to somebody, a monster network marketer that you know quite well yesterday. And- got bought by a venture capital firm and same story completely. We don't need these network marketers. The whole market's going to the internet and they just don't, you know, I never forget. I talked to Armand uh, and who's just an unbelievable guy. Say his last that's name. A real, that's a real networker. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he, oh, yeah. he just said to think that anybody, thinks that they don't need the leaders and the network marketers to keep the band going is insanity. And you guys know that many years ago in 2010, I was around when a company made a decision to eliminate the network marketing division and go straight. They had a product that a little juice and they went to it. They went straight, you know, without the distributors and they lasted like three months and they thought they had those customers because there was such brand loyalty but I'll tell you what, you start getting rid of those network marketing leaders and you are looking for a train wreck of epic proportion, in my opinion. What about you, Richard? Yeah, I, I mean, what companies need to realize and remember is who oh, that built- Network Marketing Institute is Al Bala, for God's sake. I saw him. I didn't see it, man. How would I know that? <laughs> Hello, Al Bala. There's a real networker. We got Bob, some real networkers on this Bob show. Dickey? Robert Dickey? Bob Dickey. John Hobbs? Are you Bob kidding? Dickey? All these Cody people Newton? Up to hear me? Gee, we're not on the we air anymore. Frank, so you got Frank Lopez on this show who asked a great question. Do you think uh, technology and network marketing can coexist? Absolutely. Technology is an awesome tool because of the internet and social media, we can network and build networks globally like that. But it doesn't take the place of the connection of the heart. And there's no bot that can do that, right? You guys know, like I just happened to me today. Um, I, I was trying to activate a credit card and I think I dialed the wrong number, the 888 number. And I got a, I got somebody that said, Oh, if you're uh, over the age of 60, uh, we have a special offer for you. Press one. If you're under age of 60, press two. So I pressed two just because I didn't want to hear the special offer, right? I wanted to activate my dang credit card. And this gal comes on and she said, uh, this is Kelly. Can you hear me okay? And before I had a chance to answer yes, she said, we have a special offer for you today. And I said, well, I don't want the special offer. That's why I pressed two, right? I'm over six, but I don't want special. And she keeps talking. Why? She's a bot. She was a bot? She was a bot. You got hit, you yeah. got aced by a bot? I Almost. You got botted. 
So, you know, all technology is is a tool. And what we have to understand is whatever the tool is, it's going to go out of fashion. It's going to it's going to get reinvented. It's going to be made obsolete. You remember MySpace? Remember GeoCities? You remember AOL, right? These are all concepts. If I don't have a link to it, maybe if Amber's on here, she can drop a link to it. Something I put on my LinkedIn page yesterday. But it's a super cool graphic that shows the number of subscribers on apps and websites over the last 25 years. And it starts off with like Yahoo and AOL being like, you know, dominating the world. And then as each day and month click by, it's in rapid fashion, they go like this. Facebook goes like this. Then Facebook goes like this. Instagram goes like this. And then Instagram goes like, and then TikTok goes like this. But if you step back and let it roll out over the next 20 years, I promise you it's all going to change. And we're going to have technology that we can't even imagine today that's going to be available for us to use. But it's the connection of people. It's the contribution of people. It's heart to heart. It's service to service. It's friendship. It's relationships. It's communication. Authentic communication. That's what builds networks, and that what that's what builds networks of loyal customers. And yeah, we can adapt to technology and we can move, but any company that thinks they can replace the sales force with technology, I'm not saying they can't. Maybe they can, but all they're going to end up with is revenue and a business. And what's the joy in that? Do not leave. There is a secret that I'm going to tell you right now about why he is so pissed off about the bots. This is hysterical. I can't find it. I wanted to read it to you. But oh, what's, I know what oh, you're This is the it. greatest news you have ever heard in your life, you guys. I, can't I believe hope you're you didn't hang up you're because this artificial intelligence is so damn smart. You cannot believe it. And Richard decided to, what's that thing called, Adrian? G Chat GPT? Chat GPT. So what Something Richard like did was he put his name in to see what Chat GPT was going to say about him. And you can't believe what they said. So then he said, I think I'll put in Tom Chenault. And you cannot believe what it said about me. And I'm going to leave it to his unbelievable integrity right now to tell you why he's so in love with artificial intelligence. I'll tell you. Uh, so this is called chat. G for George, P for Paul, T for Tom. And it's the newest artificial intelligence. When you type a question into the search bar, it goes into the internet and grabs every piece of data it can find. But the miracle of it is, it organizes the data into a story, into a report, into an essay, into a term paper, into an article, into a blog. And it does it in real time. I mean, it does it. I don't know if we can screen share, but anyway, so I typed in who's Richard Bliss Brook. And it came back just like this, like three paragraphs of pretty good guy, but he's had some controversial legal problems. <laughs> And uh, not everybody likes him. I don't remember what it said, but I'm I'm reading it going, what the hell? Really? Uh, so I said, I typed in, who's Tom Chenault? And it came back with nothing but beautiful, glowing. He's the most beautiful, wonderful, smartest, most successful guy in the world. So, of course, I sent it to Tom to make his day. I'm sure there's yeah. some sort of algorithm hiccups that need to be fixed. <laughs> not i think it's fine so anyway it's, still, it's you, clearly still in beta <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness that is so funny but the, but at the end of the day here's you know here here's the dark side of that and then your opportunity the dark side is it's going to get harder and harder to tell the difference about whether you are talking to a machine or a real human being Absolutely. and you experienced that the other day there's all kinds of reports about these teachers that, you know, these kids that are idiots are suddenly <laughs> like Rhodes Scholars and they can't prove it. And they know these kids are cheating and there's all this sort of stuff going on. And 
at the same time, the antidote to that is to be a real human being that demonstrates care that goes beyond what could be found on the public internet. And that's what we're about. That's what you're about. That's how we can make a stand in the world. And the people that do that well are going to completely stand away from the rest of the pack. And so that's really what I see as, as the, the shift that we're going to go through right now is that all this one to many stuff is already kind of commoditized and it's going to get way more commoditized in a hurry because of all this AI stuff. Yes, for sure. And the companies I believe that will be here prospering 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now are the ones that are playing the long game. They're playing the infinite game. They're playing for the, the second, third, fourth generation kids that can enjoy a unique, valuable, potent product line and an income. And you think about the way the world is changing, folks. Um, I mean, it's un- going to be unrecognizable. It's going to be unrecognizable from how we get our power, unrecognizable from climate I mean, unrecognizable climate, unrecognizable politics, unrecognizable economy. And you may be 50, 60, 70 years old and kind of set and you can ride out the clock. But if you got kids, you know, like Kimmy and I, she's my stepdaughter, but Haley's 25 years old. I have a kind of half, not adopted, but sort of son who's 25 years old. And I know the most important thing for the two of them are the relationships that they build over their lifetime and the financial independence that they build over their lifetime to insulate them from the politics, from the climate, from the economy, from crime, from food security, Financial independence. I'm not talking about getting rich, but I'm also not talking about Social Security or some, you know, $3,000 a month pension. I'm talking about enough money so that you can insulate yourself from the ebbs and flows of the world, which are going to be pretty chaotic in the next 50 to 100 years. I think there's nothing more important that we could live our, leave our children than a legacy of health intelligence wealth, intelligence, and the wisdom to know their most valuable asset is their relationships. Not necessarily how many they have, but the quality of those relationships. That's the currency for freedom and power in the future, is relationships. And... That's why I think network marketing has a place. And I think there'll be a lot of companies that they change everything and they try to be half and half. They try to be half social commerce and half network marketing. And, you know, they should either do one or the other, cut bait and make a commitment and run with it. Of course, those that are network marketers are always going to be in my camp because I'd still be working at a chicken plant. Tom Chenault would be drunk in a gutter somewhere, peddling penny stocks. And Adrian Adrian would be the CEO of a billion-dollar company somewhere. <laughs> yeah, the only one that steered along was Adrian, yeah. I'm done. No, you're not done. You're just getting started. This is beyond interesting, everybody. And all I know is this. You want a life like Richard Brooke, you got to fire your brain. You got to hire your heart. You got to love people. And it gets painful. And my common denominator with so many people on this screen is not network marketing. My common denominator with most of the people, I mean, I'm going through it and I'm looking at all the names in here, the people I love, the Mark Cohen's. I mean, every one of you, we have a backstory that transcends network marketing. And I want you to think about that a little bit because all this horseshit that you hear from people about this, that, and the other thing, it is just noise. Relationships run the day. The New York Times just put out an article this weekend 
that said in 2022, the most important thing people said for their happiness was relationships, not money, not security, not not having COVID, none of the politics, none of the noise. Relationships was it. Think about that a little bit. That's you. That's me. That's Dupree. And I love you, Richard Brook. We've still got six minutes left. So don't be thinking about going and eating a bonbon because you're tired of the golf. <laughs> well, I'm going to dovetail <laughs> off what you just said and remind people that relationships <clears throat> are our responsibility. Our responsibility. It is our responsibility to nurture them. It's like you probably heard the marital advice. A successful marriage is not 50-50. It's not quid pro quo. It's not pit tit for tat. It's not I do the dishes if you do dinner. Although that one comes up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it is 100%, 100%, which means that our outreach, our giving, our serving, our nurturing, our remembering, our sending that message has to come from knowing that this is how we live our life. This is our philosophy. It's not based on what are you going to do for me? Like I'm only reaching out to people that I'm trying to recruit, or I'm only reaching out to people that send me back 100% of the same kind of love. No, it can't be that way. I mean, probably 95% of the people that we reach out to, they're not in a place where they can generate that kind of reciprocal 100%. But we might be responsible for reinventing and shifting them and having them have an epiphany about who they are and what their life can be about by continuing to reach out, whether we get anything in response or not. It's our 100% responsibility to nurture those relationships. And I can tell you as a 67 year old that the most valuable thing in my life are the people that I have been responsible for nurturing those relationships. They give me wisdom. They give me fun. They give me problem solving. They give me opportunities. They give me love. They give me connection. They give me spiritual guidance. We got to be 100% responsible for reaching out. And that's really all you have to do is stay connected, right? Just stay connected. Just reach out and say, hey, like Tom. Look at the dream job of the century. And I don't even know if he's got it anymore. That you're, I think you were alluding to him, AJ, that had over at the Four Seasons where he gets to onboard the zillionaires. And literally contact map those guys and find out what moves them and have them fall in love with him, give them the phone number so they can mentor him going forward. That kid's in the catbird seat. Is he oh smart my God. enough to realize that? I would, if I was guiding all young people, I'd say get into five star hospitality, find the most exclusive resort in the world. And even if you start off as a janitor, Go to work there because AJ's only worked for the four seasons here for three years. He's already met Elon Musk twice. You know, Joe Montana, who's one of my great idols in sports, he, he and AJ are like buddies because Joe Montana comes here all the time. Robert De Niro, Jim Nance, the you know, sports commentator, you know, all these and any athlete you can think of. AJ knows them by first name. Why? Because He's the room manager and ambassador, and he's in charge of the six $25,000 a night suites. So anybody who's anybody <laughs> is AJ's buddy, and he's only 25 years old. And I told him, I said, AJ, if you just do what you know how to do, and he's very talented with people, I said, here's what's probably going to happen in your Four Seasons career. Somebody along the way is going to say, hey, we're leaving today's what, uh, Tuesday. We're leaving tomorrow on the uh, G650. Get your bag. Meet us at the airport. We want you to go with us. We have a life for you. We have a career for you. 
we want you to be our VP of, you know, customer service where all you do is take our clients golfing at this exclusive golf. You know, he's going to get some kind of crazy offer. Come with us so you can marry our daughter because we don't have a son to take over the business. So here's all the deal. Relationships. I, have to tell, I have to tell another story before you guys get out of here. You have to wait for this. So I go over to Hawaii and I live Richard Brooks life for like a week. And it was unbelievable. You cannot believe his life. He literally drove Uber over there just because of all the people, because they wouldn't hire him at the Four Seasons because he was a little bit past his expiration date. So they hired AJ. But what happens is this is hysterical. He's out there and he's a good pickleball player, Brooke is. So he's playing pickleball and there's a guy looking through the chain link fence and Richard goes, you play pickleball? The guy goes, yeah, I play pickleball. So he starts kicking Brooks' ass. And he goes, who are you? And he goes, my name's Michael Malone. I'm the head coach of the Denver Nuggets. So they play every day for two weeks. And, and Richard actually gets his name and contacts him on maps him and stays in contact with him. Next thing you know, we're trying to do this big convention here in Colorado for contact mapping. And we're trying to figure out a way to bribe Brooke into coming down. So I pick up a couple of front row seats for the Nuggets game. And so we go down there to the Nuggets game with Jordan Adler. They promptly take my seats and I'm sitting up there in the nosebleeds and they watch the whole game. Here comes Michael Malone's wife. Here comes all these famous people. They're all hanging around with Richard Brooke because of that pickleball connection. And that's what was beautiful. So the next day he comes down to Glenmont and he does the big deal. And the next thing you know, he's getting a phone call from John Elway. John Elway is going, hey, Brooke. Brooke's going, what's going on? Well, I haven't seen you in Carter Lane for a long time. Brooke's going, well, yeah, I know. Do you want to go to the game tomorrow? Yeah, I want to go to the game. Well, do you have anybody you can take with you? I don't know. I think I can take Tom Chenault. No, Tom Chenault can't go. He's got something to do. He's got to clean up the house from this mess. But we can take this guy named Thomas Vela along. Thomas Vela goes to the game. He gets to go sit in the box with Elway and go to Shanahan's for a private party with Elway and Bill Romanowski, all because of contact mapping, all because of connections that you people have that you never dreamt you had. Why is that a big deal to Thomas Vela? Because his dad, who's not in good health, his entire dream has been getting close to John Elway. Unbelievable. Richard Brooke made that all happen with his connections. Is that the best story ever that's almost true? <laughs> it, it is. And this I was going to say, here, here's the coup d'etat right here. Is that it got verified. So that's pretty good. <laughs> just a little oh, just a little bit of uh literary license but in essence that's yeah, what we do you guys please you know, remember I, people i've told that michael malone story tom a few times um you know because it's an interesting relationship they're a lovely couple and kimmy and i have a lot of fun with them and um but it all started because i am it's not a strategy. It's just who I am. I, I reach out. Like I, I ask people all the way across the tennis court, do you play pickleball and, or where do you live or where are you from? Or is that your, is this your first time here? Or, you know, everything starts with who has the courage to break the ice to ask someone it's like when we're you know five years old we ask somebody will you be my friend do we have the courage are we of the character that who we be as networkers is we make the first move not no. inappropriately not abusively not obnoxiously not three foot rule bullshit but we don't let opportunities pass us to connect. We know that 95% of them maybe go nowhere. 5% go somewhere rich. And, you know, maybe 1% end up earning us money. But if you want to be a networker, network. Don't let anybody move through your life 
without you asking them to be your friend and mean it. I got one thing going for me and that's a doctorate in drunk. And there's very few people with 34 years of sobriety on this planet that go to AA every day. That is that life raft for that relative, that aunt, that uncle, the husband, the wife, who somebody in your life. And as a result of that lifeline, people trust me. They know that I, they, they're safe with me. They know I love them. They know I, they belong in my tribe. And as a result, that is that door opener of relatedness that Richard talks about. Figure out your unique selling proposition. It isn't my looks. It isn't my great personality. It's none of those things. It's my sobriety that opens most of the big doors in my life. You've got that big door opener. You just got to look inward to find out what it is. Believe in it so much that you can literally walk up to anybody with a story and say, hey, my name is Tom Chanel. Nice to meet you. My name is Richard Brooke. Nice to meet you. My name. Yeah. You right, Richard? Yep. That's it. It's just. <clears throat> I know you guys. You know, I love you, Linda. Say hi to James Forrest, Ray Lorderman. I mean, all of you, Christina. Mark, I mean, I just go through the list of you people and you bring Don Hobbs, Thomas Vela, you bring tears to my eyes. Armand, we, we, uh, we talked about you earlier because you understand as a company owner, not a venture capitalist, that this business needs to, we've got to protect the leaders as well as the little guy and the little guy as well as the leaders. And you understand that more than anybody. Bob Dickey. Your, your bill of rights over in your policies and procedures and your, your uh, Cody Newton's dad, Bill, I mean, his stand for the, for the distributor and network marketing is something to bring tears to my eyes. And all you guys, I mean, I just love you. And I can go through this list. Taylor Warre, unbelievable guy, just rolling through it. We're so blessed. And thank you all for watching this show that was supposed to end a half an hour ago. We love you to death and we got to get out of here. Richard Brooks probably got to play pickleball. So I am actually going to play pickleball right now. Bye-bye everybody. Awesome. We love, love you. you all. Great show, Richard.